logic games, um, how do you figure out what's the best setup to approach a question? Well, I'd start by doing a lot of games of similar types in a row. So you start to see the common patterns in those game types. So in my study plans, for example, I'll have you do a bunch of ordering games, then a bunch of grouping games, then a bunch of combination games and doing them by type, you see the common indicators of what game type you're dealing with. And that can impact what kind of diagram you make. And I further subcategorize it as well, so you can better see the connections, but that's where I would start. Okay. Um, like I've taken an LSAT prep course before and what they recommend us to do when we're um, answering reading comprehension or logical reasoning is to pre-phrase it before you start looking at the answer choices. Um, but sometimes it's very difficult to pre-phrase when it's a very complex argument. Example has three premises and then a subconclusion and then a conclusion and then in, in between all that, like I have to figure out if it's a conditional or a causal relationship. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. Prephrasing isn't always the way to go. It's a useful strategy, and when you can do it, it's great, but it doesn't work for every question or for every question type. For flaw questions, for example, prephrasing is useful because there's one big flaw the argument's guilty of, and if you can identify and articulate that flaw for yourself, it's much easier to solve the question. But on the other hand, a question type like strengthen or weaken, there might be several different ways you could strengthen or weaken the argument. So you might not have any prephrase at all, or the one that you come up with might not be the one LSAC is asking about. So I wouldn't count on it as a strategy that will work all the time. Okay. Um, so like, what do you recommend to do for those types of questions then? Be open to possibilities. I mean, for, to weaken an argument, for example, you want to be open to alternative possibilities and alternative explanations. And so the one you did come up with, the one that you prephrase is simply one, but there could be many, many other possibilities as well. So if we say, for example, someone got a 180 on the LSAT, therefore they're guaranteed to gain admission to Harvard, that's an argument that's obviously open to, to attack. There are many ways we could weaken that argument. Perhaps their GPA was a 2.0. Or maybe they didn't go to undergrad at all. Or maybe they committed a felony. Or maybe their personal statement was terrible. There's a lot of reasons why even getting a 180 would not guarantee admission to Harvard. I just listed three or four different ways to weaken that argument. LSAC could ask any one of them. So it's really about engaging with it in a more informal, real world sense, like you were having a conversation with somebody. I get the sense that you're asking, you're asking about these techniques that are useful, but they can't be applied mechanically and they're not always applicable. So be, be open to alternatives. Okay. Um, how do you stay focused in a very dry reading comprehension passage? Like it's just, I don't know, it's so boring that you're kind of reading through it and then by the time you reach the second paragraph, you didn't absorb the first paragraph because it was so boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I hear what you're saying. And part of it is fake it until you make it. You have to fake interest in it and act, act like it's the most interesting thing in the world. And I would, another thing I would do is I would try to caricature or exaggerate the positions presented in the passage to make it more real world relatable. Like there's one reading comp passage that has two different political groups. One is the Congress and one is the League. And one is more moderate and one is more radical. And so they don't use those words moderate and radical. I impose them onto the passage to exaggerate the differences between those two different political groups in order to have a shorthand for them that I can hold in my mind. Because I'm not familiar with the Congress and the League. Those were very you know, niche groups in a certain political climate. They're not like the Democrats and the Republicans where I've heard of them before and I'm familiar with them. And so to make it more relatable, I exaggerate the differences and I make my own shorthand for them. Okay, that makes sense. I also look for where the author is expressing their opinion. And 
I really hold on to that for dear life. I focus on that. The details, the examples, I don't get wrapped up in them. Those are really meant to trip you up. And those you can always go back to when you need to. I just try to walk away with what's the main idea. And the main idea is the author's opinion wherever they articulate it. I use that as my major takeaway from the passage. Okay, another mistake I keep making is like, I will confuse a conditional relationship for a causal one and or vice versa. And like, there's certain times where I can distinguish it. So if there's like language, oh, unless, without, so that, that indicates a necessary condition. So that's, that's easy. But then there are times where they don't have these trigger words. So then um, I can't really distinguish it anymore. Okay. So when you're dealing with conditional relationships, there will often be some conditional indicator somewhere. It may be one of those annoying words like unless, except, until, without. It could be if, then. It could be one of the variations on sufficient necessary indicators. And like the contrapositive, I would really want you to drill those because those are one of the few things that you do want to memorize in a way so that so much so that it really becomes automatic and innate where you're not doing it by rope, but you really understand it on a deep level. And in the absence of conditional indicators, you really do have to once again engage with it in a real world sense to see what the relationship is. And I know that there are resources that talk about conditionality versus causality, and they, they really stress the importance of those differences. Personally, I think that simply engaging with it in a real world sense is typically enough. If you're engaging with it like you're having a conversation with someone, it becomes much easier to poke holes in it, I think. And the LSAT's not testing your ability to see what is the difference between them. They're testing your ability to do whatever the task is at hand. Strengthen, weaken, point out the flaw, resolve the paradox, things of that nature. Okay. So I would focus on whenever you're dealing with an argument, just engaging and asking yourself, how reasonable is this? What are they failing to consider? Or what are they not bothering to explicitly state? And what are the underlying assumptions in this argument? How strong is it? And then test it a little bit by asking yourself, how could I weaken this? How could I strengthen it? Okay, that makes sense. Um, so I'm going to write my LSAT on January 13th. So that's barely two weeks from now. Um, my practice score is not that great right now. So like, what do you suggest that I do from now to like then to just, I guess, maximize uh, potential? I would suggest you do on average, no more than two timed exams per week over the next two or so weeks. So for you, that may be two exams, that may be three exams, nothing more than that. Just a couple of exams along with detailed review of those exams and that's pretty much it. The fact, though, that you're not feeling proficient in the contrapositive suggests to me that January might be too soon for you. You could take January, but if you want to reach your fullest potential on the LSAT, I would want things of that nature to be airtight for you before you walk into test day and honestly be airtight for you the, at least one month before, if not more than that. So you could take January and apply with whatever you get, but if you want to reach your fullest potential, I think it might require a little bit more time. I know, that, I know that's not the question you asked, but part of my role as a coach is to really tell it to you like it is, because that's what will best serve you in the admissions process. I have no choice but to take the January one, because if I want to get into law school September 2020, um, the latest LSAT test that my schools are taking is like the January one. So if I don't take it, then I'm like not considered at all. Yeah, no, I hear what you're saying. The alternative then is to take it a little bit later and apply at the beginning of the next cycle, which I know nobody ever wants to hear that and nobody ever wants to do it, but your odds are higher and there's more scholarship money available simply by applying at the beginning of the cycle. And if you also have a higher LSAT score on top of that, you're really boosting yourself up significantly. Um. No, I'm still going to write it in January. I'm just honestly giving you what I think is the best course of action for you to reach your fullest potential on the LSAT. If you want to simply go for January, 
you could do a couple of exams along with review of those exams. But I would add on heavy drilling in all of those fundamentals areas. Like contrapositive, you got to have that down pat before you walk in on test day. Conditionality, causality, you got to have that down pat. It should be automatic for you. It should be an airtight foundation. Okay. Um, all right. Any other questions for you? I mean, if I have to write again, then like I'll just aim for like maybe September. That's fine. Yeah, but ideally, I mean, I'm I'm just gonna basically cram for the next two weeks, and we'll just see what comes out then. Yeah. I just wouldn't want you to run the risk of burnout on that. So I would give it your all, but don't approach it from the mindset of cramming. Approach it from the mindset of, I'm going to do my best on this, but while the LSAT as a whole is incredibly important, no one particular test date will make or break you. And you can retake. I think that taking in January, seeing what happens, you can even apply with that. But again, if you want to reach your fullest potential on this, giving it more time would only help you. So going for September is a great option. It gives you several months to study at a fairly relaxed pace to shore up any weak areas you have and then apply the very beginning of the next cycle. Again, I know that nobody ever wants to hear that advice, but it really is. I mean, if you think about it this way, getting even just a few more points on your LSAT score could get you tens of thousands of dollars in scholarship money or get you into a better law school which means higher salary on average upon graduating. So the ROI on that is huge. It's the easiest money you'll ever make to get just a few points more. Okay, well, uh, thank you for your pointers. I'm gonna like do everything you just told me. Awesome, glad to help. Before we sign off, what would you say is the biggest insight you got from our call today? Um, I guess the biggest insight is like, um, that if I can't prephrase something, then I'll just have to like look at it in like a real perspective and just try to attack the argument. Like a healthy sense of like skepticism could like help weed out the potential wrong answers. Awesome. I love it. Well, please keep in touch and let me know if I can help in any way as you move forward. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.